On this edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast, we break down why re-signing Mitch Moreland was such a savvy offseason move by Boston, and whether we can learn anything from Alex Cora's decision-making in Oakland. We also chat with Laura Armstrong, Blue Jays beat writer for the Toronto Star, to figure out whether the Jays could cause problems for the Red Sox and Yankees in the American League East this season. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast. I'm Ricky Doyle, joined, as always, by Dakota Randall. Dakota, what's going on? Not too much, man. How you doing? I am doing fantastic. Uh, so we're getting in the, the real swing of things. We're finding our stride, I think, at least. Um, the Red Sox, uh, another, in, another interesting week. Every time we do this, I feel like we're coming off of some sort of something. Something weird happened, yeah, yeah. something big. So this time around, they're coming off a six-game West Coast trip against the LA Angels and the Oakland Athletics. Uh, and it was kind of the, the tale of two trips, I guess you could say. Yep. Uh, it started off, they looked like they were just going to you know, steamroll the competition out, left, out, uh, out west. Uh, you know, starting off by outscoring the Angels 27-3, to uh, just completely kind of cementing themselves in the minds of many as the best team in baseball uh, if they weren't already regarded as such. But then they go to Oakland, and things changed a little bit. Obviously, they, they were there were no hit on, on Saturday. Well, the first game, they looked great, too. They looked like the same Fra- socks. Yeah, so that's Friday why night, it was, it was yeah. very similar to what you had been seeing so far in the sense that, you know, they they hung around a little bit. They fell behind 3 nothing, but then they, they tied it up on the Jackie Bradley Jr. home run. And then Mitchie, F- Mitchie know, Fourbags. Mitchie grand Fourbags, salami. Grand Salami, break up the bread and mustard, and next thing you know, they're, they're on their way to another victory. But Saturday was when, uh, you know, the no-hitter came, and then the weekend took a turn for the worst. Uh, obviously not time to panic. We're just talking about a, a two-game sample size there, a two-game losing streak. But it's the first kind of uh, indication that it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows from here on out. Yeah, it's the first indication that the Red Sox will not go 159 and three. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we'll get into to several things, uh, what, we, what we saw over the course of that trip, and also preview the, the upcoming series against the Blue Jays and they're back home for what seems like the 17th series of the season against the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah. Uh, and then the Kansas City Royals after that. But uh, I don't know. So we'll just start off. What kind of – what stood out to you? What was it, let's start with the good. Okay. Because, the, like, like I said, this, this trip was full of both good and bad. Uh, for me, uh, the biggest the – good, the good is that um, – the starting pitching remains a, a huge strength for this team. Um, the, I, I still don't think there's been any real clunker aside from Eduardo Rodriguez's uh, first start off the DL. I mean, Paul Moran's, yeah, he got he gave up three runs. You, you kind of give him a pass too because he was coming off the DL. Right. Um, still, you know, was able to settle down a little bit. But overall, I mean, the starting pitching continues to go up and you know give up three runs or less more often than not, one run or less, and. Um, you know, it just it especially you know I, I want to I've been wanting to see how David Price came back from uh, that incident against the Yankees, and uh, I know he gave up that three-run home run to Chris Davis on Sunday, but he's been great all season long, and uh, as we get further and further, and the and the starters continue to go out and have quality outings, um, including against good teams like the Angels, you know, I think it's clear that, that barring injury, this is a rotation that really should not not could but should carry this team uh, either to a, at least to the playoffs. You know, I think that, that that's how good this rotation should be. And, um, yeah, that's my, that's my, my biggest positive takeaway is that the, the starting rotation continues to, to really be a plus for yeah, this squad. Yeah, you haven't really, like you said, you haven't had that one huge clunker. Like, you no. know, usually you'll, look, you'll have that one stat line that kind of just makes you want to throw up in your mouth. Yeah, and, uh, again, I give Rodriguez and Pomeranz passes for those. You know, those are kind of outliers for me. Yeah, I, certainly – what a uh, just a benefit too for Drew Pomeranz coming back into a situation where this team is firing on all cylinders, and the Bruins are in the midst of a playoff run. The Celtics are in the midst of a playoff run. Like Drew Pomeranz coming back could have got absolutely shellacked in that first outing, and I don't think anybody would have batted an eyelash. That, right, and that he, was just we're talking about easing your way into things. Right, and it's on the West Coast. Nobody really saw it. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it was the, like Wednesday night ESPN, you know, against the Yankees. Or anything yeah, like that, that was so. Certainly, nobody yeah. was looking at him as the uh, like a, a savior of sorts. Yeah. But I do feel like, to some extent, we're kind of. I feel like people are underselling his return. I think you kind of forget how good he was last year. I mean, all star caliber. Yeah. Saved their ass on several occasions. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, what he is this year, it's. I mean, I, I especially if he's going to seen, but if he's going to give you that as a, as your fourth or fifth starter, I mean, that's huge. That's big. That's big time stuff. So, you know, if he, if he does replicate last year's performance, now, uh, I I, I want to touch on this one good thing because we we mentioned the the Friday night win, which was kind of uh, a good little microcosm of what they've had for the better part of the season. Uh, it's Mitch Moreland. Mitch Moreland, a guy that over the off season, you know, they brought him back on a two year contract, thirteen million dollars in December. Um, it kind of there was some moans and groans, I would say, at the time. I mean, it was I think people were accepting of the deal and say, you know, nothing against Mitch Moreland, but for a team that, you know, in an off season where you're you're looking for that splash, this was two months before they signed JD Martinez, and there was this the sense that. Is this all they're going to do? Right. Um, and now you look at him, and he's been an incredibly value, valuable contributor. Uh, every time he's been put in the lineup, especially recently, obviously, uh, with the Grand Slam on Friday. But And great defense. Great defense. Give, de- give him credit for that. Looking back, I mean, this move, for all the, you know, the, the flack that it got, because, and we even touched on this a few weeks ago, of how the team had sort of a same feel to it. Yeah. And... I think no move really symbolized that more than bringing back Mitch Moreland. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I agree. It's it's not a knock on him. He's a I feel like if your only offseason move player. was re-upping Matt Barnes. It, yeah, exactly. It so like. Not <laughs> something that's going to move the needle, but uh, I mean, it, it made sense at the time. I, I mean, obviously, you're adding a, a solid, uh, re- bringing back a solid left-handed compliment to Hanley Ramirez, which. At that time, you didn't know what Hanley was going to give you. I think it's been better than ex- I mean, we know. still don't know. We still don't know, but I'd say <laughs> the early returns for this season have been better than expected. Would you, is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think the big thing, uh, what I'm happy with uh, with how they've used Moreland is, and, and I was critical of Cora early on in the season for giving guys uh, too much rest, too many days off. And while I still do have some issues with that, you know, I think at this point you have to say he was right. I mean, they started 17 and three, um, and I think. You know, the other night he uses Moreland. He, he benches, or he doesn't bench, he, he gives J.D. Martinez a night off, you know, while Martinez is scorching the ball. Everyone kind of looks at it and says, you know, what's going on here? But, I, you know, I think Cora identified the matchup because Moreland had good numbers, really good numbers, against Kendall Graveman, the A starter on Friday. And I think Cora looked at it and said, this is, a, you know, a night to give Martinez a, a night off, keep with our philosophy of giving guys rest. Also a great opportunity to get Moreland uh, into the game and get a start against a guy he's had success with, and he gets rewarded with a grand slam. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wondered how they were going to use Moreland because, again, you know, you have Martinez and, and Hanley, you know, going back, you know, Hanley at first and then DH, and it just didn't seem to be a good fit for Moreland, but uh, I think Core has shown an ability to identify uh, when to use him best and when to give him his at, at bats. And this kind of goes into what we said uh, a couple weeks ago where, you know, he might have one of his you know, big strengths is he might, core, I mean, um, might have a good pulse of when to give guys days off and, you know, when they can get too cold because he was a utility player. He was a bench guy. Um, so, that, you know, with, with, as far as the Mitch Moreland thing is concerned, the biggest plus for me is that they seem to have a good idea of how to use him uh, and when to get him at bats. And that's big because, you know, he can be productive and he yeah, can help you. He, you're right. Once The second they brought in, once they finally signed Martinez, which seemed like a foregone conclusion throughout the offseason, it was. You immediately thought, how are they going to make this work? Right. Uh, and Moreland being the guy that you've sort of figured he was probably going to lose the most playing time in the bunch. Um, but I just think it's interesting, too, even looking back, like the dynamic of signing Moreland before then, you know, a few months before signing J.D. Martinez, because at that time, it was kind of when they were in that staring contest with Scott Boris a little bit. Right. Um, and then they came out, at, Dombrowski came out after... Uh, the the Moreland signing and said, you know, we'd be comfortable standing pat. I don't think anybody believed him. No, uh, no. But it certainly, it seemed like it was a move geared towards sending the message that, you know, we're not going to break the bank for Martinez, so to speak. I mean, I think they, at the end of the day, I think they got a pretty good deal out of that. Yep. Um, and then it also just, you know, the, the intangible benefit of kind of, uh, I don't want to say giving Hanley a kick in the pants, but if you're Hanley Ramirez and you're sitting there and they bring in, they bring back Mitch Moreland and all of, and then J.D. Martinez and you're looking at it and all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're competing for playing time, competing for at-bats, 
Right. Um, Make no mistake, Hanley wants that vesting option. Obviously, wa- I mean, it's twenty million dollars. Seven plate appearances. So yeah. that, and that was another layer to it as well. It was you know you, you bring back Moreland, and the, another idea is that this is kind of the safeguard that against that option vesting. Now, to this point, I don't think it's going to be prohibit that from happening. I mean, and if Hanley doesn't get to that number of plate appearances, it's either because he falls off you know, a cliff here and, and starts performing like he did a couple of years ago after a hot April, or it's a, a situation where he, he gets hurt again. Right. Because um, right now it seems like he's on the fast track to that. But I don't know. I just think overall that the, the, the re-signing of Mitch Moreland was kind of just a – it flew under the radar. Right. Didn't think too much of it. Weren't really sure what his exact role would be. Uh but he has found that they are carving out a role for him, and it's and it's paying off. And it makes sense. You mentioned he's a guy that you you bring off the bench, and you can expect him to have success. I mean, he, his numbers as a pinch hitter over the course of his career are pretty impressive. And you know, he's kind of a, a double insurance policy because, you know, he can he is a great fill in either if Hanley gets hurt at first base or if JD Martinez for some reason goes down as as your primary DH. Moreland is a is a productive enough bat, a productive enough bat. <laughs> to uh, to to fill in at either one of those spots. So um, yeah, you know that, and like I said, that's that's what I'm most pleased about with it is that they seem to have a plan for him, which you know is the opposite of what they have for Blake Swihart. But we'll avoid. We've harped on that for three straight weeks, so we won't do that yeah, we'll, this week. We'll, we'll but, steer uh, clear. <laughs> yeah, we'll steer clear. Um, so yeah, so now we've kind of we've we've gone into the good, uh, the the positive things that resonated with us. What about what about the bad? I know I have mine, but I want to hear yours first. What's your What's kind of a bad thing that has, has come up for you over the past week or, well, or so? All right, so when we last week we sat here and we talked about the kind of the theme of last week's podcast was overall are the Red Sox the best team in baseball right now, uh, and, and if not, if you don't think they are, what do you need to see to prove to you that they are the best team in baseball? And I and I said that what I wanted to see from this team was that. I want to see, one, how they'd handle close games, particularly on the road, uh, against good opponents, and, and then also how they kind of battle through difficult parts of their schedule. Because, let's face it, they've pretty much had a cakewalk thus far. Right. I mean, they have faced some, some bad opponents. They've had a whole bunch of built-in off days from their schedule. Um, and they've also blown teams out so that we haven't necessarily seen uh, situations where they've had to make these crucial decisions, like Alex Cora has, for you know, deserves a ton of credit for just kind of setting the tempo and, like, in a, from a bigger picture standpoint, uh, kind of creating the vibe in the clubhouse, that sort of thing, but has not really been tested from a from a managerial, from a tactical standpoint. Uh, the one time, really, up until this weekend, was on opening day, and it, it didn't it didn't work out well. That first series, really, there were they were a few during that series that that stuck out. So, and he's been mostly clean since until right know, Sunday. In, until Sunday, where there were a couple situations that came up that you can kind of that you can second guess, or in some instances even first guess, because uh, th- I thought at the time the decision to keep David Price in uh, after you know striking out Jed Lowry, you, you got the the meat of the order coming up for Oakland in the eighth inning of the tie game. Uh, Carson Smith's all warmed up. And he stuck with Price, which I don't have a huge problem with, although I probably, I, I think I would have went to Smith in that situation. Obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm definitely going to go to Smith right. in that situation. But my issue is this, is that he, in explaining why he kept David Price in, Cora's explanation centered around the conviction, the quote-unquote conviction that Price showed in the previous at-bat to Jed Lowry, which... It's sort of like a that's a feel thing. Like right. that's a gut that's a gut move. You know, you're playing you're thinking you just you're playing the feel rather than what the the analytics say. Which is a thing you do want in a manager sometimes. But I know where you're going with this. So yeah. I don't know and again, and that I don't have a problem with that either. But I just find it it's very interesting when it you kinda you put that up against what was said throughout spring training and what's kind of been said at points throughout the early part of the season what I, there's been such an emphasis on this analytical approach to the game, and I think that it's by then going and choosing to stay with David Price based on conviction, uh, it just seems like there's a little bit of philosophical inconsistency there. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I do. I understand what you're saying, and 
And I'm not saying, like, I don't think necessarily you have to choose one or the other, be like this hard and fast analytical guru who does everything straight by the numbers, what the book says, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I also don't think you have to commit to being that guy that just flies by the seat of your pants and goes strictly based on your feeling. Is is I think a, a balancing act that you have to strike as a manager. But I just think I just thought it was interesting that you know that so much has been placed on because even in the, in the introductory press conference, Alex Core had mentioned several times the word you know analytics or some variation of that. Um, so it just when you then have this situation where he goes he rolls with the starter. Uh, especially after throw, you know, throughout the first couple of weeks, limiting the pitch counts of his starter and taking them out early, I just think it's it's weird. Uh, it just I maybe mean, weird's not maybe the right word, but it's it's notable. My problem with it was is it never should have gotten to the point where he even needed to, to to have or to, to to look at his feel or assess his feel, whatever. I don't know, it's a weird thing to say, but you know what I mean. Because yeah. I mean I understand. Uh, if you wanted to send him back out in the eight to face Maxwell, who's a left-handed batter, but you had four righties after then, and Smith was ready to go, and so he got he got Maxwell out, and then Smith sat down, which was bizarre to me. So what's, you know, I didn't understand the point there. And then you know, then Smith got back up later in the inning, but Smith is ready to go. So for me, with four righties coming up, he, you know. I, either Price doesn't come out for the eighth or he just faces a left-hander at the start of the eighth and then you go to Smith. So I just think that that should have been the move right there. And then from then on, like you said, you know, what it, I don't necessarily mind him going by feel. I mean, I think that's, that's important for managers to do. Um, but I just, you know, like you said, there has to be some sort of balance. And for me, the biggest thing was I just, I still can't get by why and I know he said after the game they're just not going to go to him in the eighth this early in the season, but why Craig Kimbrell wasn't even warming in that situation? Right. I mean, for me, I understand preserving him, and I understand you know, if he's worked a lot this season, but I mean, the Red Sox have been killing teams. Kimbrell hasn't really had to pitch. He's pitched you know, one, one time, I think, in the past you know, eight days. Right. Really. So it's it was a, basically just a yeah. good workout in Anaheim. Right, and it's a close game, and, and the, uh, not close game, it's a tie game. And you know, why not bring him in there? It's one batter in the eighth, and I uh, hope you get the, the lead in the top of the ninth, and he closes it out. If not, he pitches the bottom in the ninth, and you see what happens in extras. So yeah. I just, and he said, you know, someone asked him after the game, why, you know, would you have, ha would you have gone to Kimball? And he said, no. And then I wish the person would have asked why, because I just, I wonder why too. What's, you know, what's the issue with using him? And it seems and to be a little bit of a change too, because if I remember correctly, in spring training, when that topic came up, it seemed like they were. He was at least open-minded to the idea of bringing him in in a situation like that. He might have even outlined like that specific scenario. Almost. And Kimbrel said he wants to. And so, so it, but then went on to say that you know he was gonna him and that was something that they would have to sit down and kind of figure out, um, sort of just a you know, player manager discussion. So I don't know if now what we're seeing is a product of something that they had talked about, but uh, that's another. That's another. Bigger picture question here is the use of Craig Kimbrell. Right. I mean, what are you? And just the use of a closer in general across baseball really is when you know when to use him. Because I mean, there was a situation in the Brewers game recently uh, where they turned you know, in a high leverage situation in the sixth inning to a guy with closing experience, and basically the reasoning, the, the rationale is that that's the game. Like that could potentially be the game right there. And I just think I, I worry a little bit about preserving guys. Uh, but in planning ahead for moments that might never come. Right, uh, I agree. And, and that was the situation there with by not using Kimbrell, and it also was a situation uh, on the other side of things where they decided not to bring up either Mookie Betts, Hanley Ramirez, or Eduardo Nunez uh, to pinch hit for either Christian Va Vasquez or Sue Whalen. Right, and so, so two that's different things, but both the same premise of kind of planning ahead for moments that you might not see happen. Yeah, and, and real quick, I don't want to harp, harp on core for too long, but, you know, my thing is I've come around on, uh, on, on you know, come around on his bigger picture ideas, the resting, resting guys a lot more than we were accustomed to. I've come around on that, and uh, I, his, his, you know, the whole approach to hitting and everything, I've, I've come around on these bigger picture ideas. What I need to see from him and, and you know, the things that he's got to clean up as we get later into the season is the in-game management, um, you know, making these moves in tight games. That's what I want to see him clean up. And uh, but real, but I think it's important to get back to that to uh, to, to go off from that as far as our overall topic. But real quick, just for my my bad that I wanted to get to. Also, too, I just want to mention that I don't necessarily 
I'm not sure if this will be a negative in the long run. I, like, I just oh, it can see, be. I mean, it could be, <laughs> but I do want to say that what I want to see mostly is just consistency in the decision making. I, yeah, I just want to see that, he, that they can, the decisions can be made in those spots. But I agree. Well, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just – and I don't want to take away too much from a no-hitter. It happens. Good teams get no-hit sometimes. Um, my biggest concern out of that and even out of the next game is, you know, I think we all love the aggressive approach right now, swinging early in counts, making a lot of contact, driving the ball. Um, you know, is that approach – gonna you know kind of come back to hurt them in certain games when they get in, they get into really close games with pitchers uh, who are dealing and the Red Sox need to slow the game down kind of, you know the way they used to grind out at bats um, and sort of you know make the pitcher throw a lot of pitches and, and sort of get them out of there um, and just play the game a different way you know approach approach the offense a different way and uh, I just wonder if they're gonna get so enamored with this aggressive approach and, and swinging early that when it comes time where you absolutely have to do the opposite I wonder if they'll be able to um, but you know so that, that's just you know one concern I have but it's you know it's we need to see them in more situations like that before you can really make an assessment well that's the thing is we're we're honing in on these you know one singular moment in the eighth inning of a game in the middle of April but trying to extrapolate it over the course of 162 games we're trying to take a bigger picture approach to it right um, the other thing I want to, so you, you talked about Cora, is he an analytical manager, is he a field manager, is he somewhere between the middle? So we, we kind of are wondering, you know, what's his identity as a manager? And, uh, you know, I know, I think one big question for me at this point in the season is what is the Red Sox identity? You know, what is their identity as a team? And uh, is it too early to tell? Uh, do we have a good idea yet? And uh, I don't know, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you first. What do you think on is the, the team's identity? On the topic right? of Cora, real quick, too, is... I wonder if he's still kind of trying to figure that out. Well, of course I he mean, is. He's a rookie manager. You know, There's I mean, no like doubt about it's, it. He has been – one thing you can say about him, too, is how just upfront, transparent, honest, whatever, whatever word you want to use to describe it, he's right. been since day one. Uh, and, is I mean, he's even admitted, admitted to making a, a managerial mistake because he was you know too excited or whatever it was in that game early in the season when he left J.D. Martinez on the field. Um so yeah, there there are going to be some some bumps along the way, and I think there's there's going to be a lot of situations where he probably uh, mixes and matches a little bit. So I guess that I would just like to to see over the course of you know once we get to the mid season, maybe I think you'll have a better idea as to where he's going to go and where he's going to lean in certain certain situations, whether it be uh, getting guys days off or you know in certain spots when he's going to pinch hit. Just things like that. But uh, as far as an identity for the, the team as a whole goes, I see, I, uh, man, that's a tough one because I think any team strives to be well balanced, right? I mean, I, I right. think ideally you're going to be, you're going to have both the offense uh, and the pitching to, to do damage. But if I'm thinking this team has the, the potential to have an elite offense. I, I've, what I've seen so far from the offense is kind of ahead of where I thought it would be at this point in the season. I think once the weather gets a little bit warmer, this team's going to heat up even more. I think you'll see bigger numbers across the board, which is um, you know, crazy to think that they're just scratching the surface of what they could be, but I just think it speaks to the talent in that lineup. And then for, uh, you mentioned all the positives to the rotation, so I guess I, when I look at this team, I think that a good sort of outline of what they could become is last year's Astros. I think that there's been a lot of parallels between the two that Alex Cora is even drawn early in, in the early going. You know, when he's trying to manage them, the Red Sox just like he ma- like like how I think uh, he, yeah, Hinch. I think he's trying to instill yeah. a lot of things that he used as the bench coach in Houston last season. Uh, I mean, he's compared Mookie Betts to George Springer on several occasions in terms of uh, being that aggressive guy at the top of the order that can kind of get the ball rolling. So They're I such think, different players, though. But go ahead. Yeah, uh, Yeah. well, I just think that he's trying to, to kind of create that, that sort of vibe also just from a, from a chemistry standpoint. And I, I think that they have the potential to be what that team was last year, which was an elite offensive team with a very good starting rotation. Uh, I think this rotation, the Red Sox rotation, has the potential to be even better than Houston was last season. But no, I don't so, think they have it. Well, we'll see. But I don't know if they're better than Houston's this season. Not this season. Yeah, not Houston's this season. Gotta. Last season, 
last season up until they got ver- they kind of kicked it into another gear with the Verlander right. uh, trade as well. But I don't know. I just look at the last year's Astros team as a, a team that the Red Sox uh, can strive to be and should strive to be, obviously, given the results. <laughs> I mean, right, and I, I mean obviously that's the sailing here is the World Series. Right, yeah, and that's it's not a bad team to compare yourself to. Um, for me, and I, this is kind of kind of sound weird because it's like the fact that they have an I I think their identity is the fact that they lack an identity, and what I mean by that is it's very. I, uh, I know it's so, so cerebral. My, my uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you know this is a team that can beat you a lot of different ways, and. I don't think at any point this, se- this season we're going to look at this team and go, oh, they're a power hitting team. Oh, they're a small ball team. Oh, they're a speed team. You know, or they're, they're all starting pitching, no offense. I don't think it's going to end up being one extreme that this team has, an I- or you know, one identity that this team has so clearly over the others. I think it's going to be what you've already seen already. They can come back on you if they need to. They can blow you out if they need to. They can win close games. You know, they have a great closer. Um, you know, they can win tough pitching matchups. I just think you know, they can play defense when they need to. I just, like you said, it's what, being well balanced is something every team strives for. And with that is a team that can beat you in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I don't know, there won't be many situations where the Red Sox face a team where you say, oh, they, you know, they definitely have the advantage here or the advantage here. I just think they're ba- so balanced across the board that th- no matter who they play, they, they should be able to adapt and, and find a way you know, to play that team style or, you know, to, to figure out what they need to do to beat different teams regardless of matchups. And I just think they've shown an ability early on to win in a variety of different fashions. And is that ideal? I don't know. I mean, you, you, you might, you could certainly make the case where you'd say, I just wish they were a team that could smash the ball out of the ballpark and forget the rest, like the Yankees. Right. You could easily make that case that that's preferable. Um, me person, and, and that might, you know, because the, ultimately it's how, what kind of team are you in the playoffs? And um, we, we, we still don't really know that. Um, but for me, the identity is just that this is a team so far that is solid to above average across the board and has the ability to beat you in so many different ways. And I think that is why they are, they're, they're at least well positioned to be a very good regular season team. Jury's out on the postseason, but that's why I feel like they can win. They should win the AL East is because, you know, they are the most well-balanced team in the division and one of the most well-balanced teams in the American League in all of baseball. Um, it's so. almost like they they haven't changed much from last year from a roster standpoint and even coming into the season, the field standpoint, but it's like they just took everything and turned it up a couple notches. Yeah. Like, they well, were, and they're young, so you, let, you, you hope these guys it, take the next step, and, and Nebraska said that. This is exactly what they kind of envisioned. Uh, I think there was a lot of talk throughout the offseason of them banking on just nat- you know, natural progression, getting better production from certain guys in the lineup, whether it be uh, Mookie Betts going more back towards his uh, 2016 MVP form, Xander Bogarts bouncing back after a pretty shaky season last year. Just you know, a, lot of, a lot of things you could point to and say we're expecting that to be better this year. Obviously in the rotation, David Price, Rick Porcello bouncing back. Um, so it was sort of a... Uh, you had to be somewhat cautious with that type of optimism because what if it turns out that those things don't happen? You know, those uh, the, the shaky results weren't an aberration. Um, but I just think that, you know, they, they had this vision and so far it has come to fruition. Uh, and we'll see, you know, we'll see where it goes from here. But I agree with you in the sense that this team is kind of the, the versatility or right just and we've seen that with their depth ways. too yeah depth that, and that ultimately could be key too because uh, you know they've already been you know the, the Xander Bogarts injury already popped up but they're inevitably going to be some other ailments throughout the season so right uh, see how they handle those yep and a big series coming up here uh, with the Blue Jays yeah I'm not interested you know? about this Blue Jays series because the Blue Jays are uh, they're you know they're they're in there. They're, they're in the so things. uninteresting to me. Let's be honest. Like I, I they are. They're but so and you know with all respect to uh, Laura Armstrong, who we're going to speak to earlier. Uh, nothing against the team she follows, but I just find them to be so uninteresting this year, especially with Donaldson gone, and uh, or not gone, but on the disabled list, and Batista gone. Um, you know, it's still they they can bang that park out every night for the most part, and there's a lot of energy with that team, and they have some young guys. But I think everybody know, like. Everybody must feel like a rebuild is coming there. 
it, they're in that and weird in between stage. Yeah, they're, but they're not good enough to have a surprise year. Is middle of the pack. Uh, I I think they'll contend for a second wild card spot up until you know mid September maybe or you know you'll look up in about mid September and they'll be kind of that in that three and a half four games back of the second wild the team that's kind of a pain in the ass to play against but isn't necessarily the uh, you know you don't necessarily think they'll they'll take hold of that second spot they might but I I think I don't know I I firmly believe this team ends up being sellers at the deadline I'm if on August 1st I fully expect Donaldson to be on another team and Justin Smoke to be on another team if I think it's what they should do if they ultimately figure out that you know, I, they're building towards two thousand. I think they can be sneaky good next year. So I think they got some talent coming up through that system. Yeah, um, and if Stroman just like takes the next step, you know. That well, that's and that's one thing that leads me to believe that this team might actually be somewhat decent. Is I think their rotation is going to get a little bit better. The rotation sucks so far, but there's some there's some decent arms there. Yeah, uh, but we still we don't know what Aaron Sanchez really is. We don't know what Marco Estrada really is. J. A. Happ is okay. I just think there's so many question marks on the team, and, and they, I'll be curious to ask uh, Laura about about this, whether you know what they think of the rebuild around there. But I just think they're delaying the inevitable. I think, you know, you're not going to win a World Series. You're, you, even if you make the playoffs, you're not going to. I don't think they even have a chance to make the playoffs. But I just that team has some really really good prospects, and they're not that far away. And they still have you know Strowman's young. You know, they have other good young pieces there. Um, yeah, I don't think their rebuild would take too long. I just think they should get to it sooner rather than later. So they're a classic case of a team that can kind of showcase their assets from the uh, at the beginning of the season. But they are a tough opponent. The Red Sox obviously need to take them seriously. I mean, they just played well against the Yankees. So, you know, the Blue Jays are always tough. So it is going to be a tough series for the Red Sox. Yeah, just a different Blue Jays team than I think uh, we're accustomed to seeing. Uh, a little bit of different feel. So, uh, but as you mentioned, we did catch up with Laura Armstrong. Blue Jays beat writer for the Toronto Star. Um, she obviously been, you've been covering them on a, a day-to-day basis. So uh, can fill us in on really what's going on north of the border and what we should look forward to both in this upcoming series and from the Blue Jays throughout the entire 2018 season. Joined now by Laura Armstrong of the Toronto Star. Blue Jays beat writer. Laura, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, I think uh, we'll start off with this because obviously uh, the Red Sox traveling to Toronto to take on the, the Blue Jays for a three game series. I think a lot of people coming into the season uh, expected the AL East to, to be a two horse race, probably between the, the Red Sox and the Yankees. But the Blue Jays uh, entering play at 13 and 8 are kind of throwing a wrench into that, upsetting the apple cart a little bit. Uh, what have you seen from the Blue Jays so far, and you know how have they performed relative to your expectations? Because, like I said, I know the expectations around here were that it would be Red Sox, Yankees, you know, start to finish. But uh, I wasn't sure if maybe you had a different outlook at the beginning of the season throughout spring training. Yeah, no, I think that our expectation and the general expectation in Toronto was th- similar to probably what your expectations were in the sense that it was going to be a two-horse race. Um, you know, the Jays certainly didn't have the season that they didn't want, certainly didn't have the season that they wanted to have last year. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of changes to the team over the course of the off season, especially no really big, big name signings. Um, so it, it didn't really seem like the, the team was going to be that different, especially considering the upgrades that the Red Sox made, the upgrades that the Yankees made, and both of those teams finishing ahead of the Blue Jays last year, it kind of seemed like the Blue Jays probably weren't going to be able to to keep up. What I will say about the team and what I did notice over the course of spring training in particular was that players within the Blue Jays clubhouse would volunteer the fact that they thought that they could play with the Yankees and the Red Sox. And while, you know, had the Jays gone 2-11 and as they did to start the year last year, we probably just would have looked at them like they were nuts. <laughs> now it's sort of like that quiet confidence and that belief has really gone well for the Blue Jays. So, I mean, yes, at this point they, they've surprised. And, and and I mean, that's a great thing for, for Toronto. Obviously, the city is 
as your city is probably very enraptured by hockey playoffs and basketball playoffs. Oh, yeah. But the Blue Jays, you know, certainly want to be in a position when people tar- start turning their head back to baseball after those seasons are done where they're, you know, competitive at least. Yeah, how how engaged are fans with this team right now? Because, like you said, that is kind um, of something that's going on around here locally as well where, you know, you have two other teams in the midst of a playoff push and then it's kind of – you got baseball on the back burner a little bit, but acknowledging the fact that, okay, once these teams are done, you, you know, you have a pretty good baseball team to fall back on. Yeah, for sure. Baseball has definitely been on the back burner. It feels like the Blue Jays haven't been around that much. They had a really long road trip like right the second week of the season and then they were gone with the Yankees over the weekend so we haven't seen them that much but the crowds certainly haven't been um huge by any stretch of the imagination um so yeah I think it's certainly a a matter of the Blue Jays as you said being on the back burner right now and and they're just hoping that they can sort of keep treading water keep playing well until baseball season sort of comes around the dome opens that that brings a lot more people uh, into the ballpark, and uh, you know they're not worried. They right. they know that Toronto is a great sports um, town, and everybody sort of has their moments. And and right now is not necessarily the Jays' moment. And for them to sort of have the time to ease into the season and and get some confidence, I don't think is a terrible thing. Um, hey, Laura, I'm just wondering, uh, prior to the season, how much, if at all the term rebuild was was thrown around. And if the Jays eventually this season sort of regret, regress back to where people expect them to be, what do you think the front office will do about it? Yeah, so I, the, the term rebound has been thrown around, I think, since the beginning of last year, um, especially with uh, the, the start that the Blue Jays got off to at the beginning of last season. And a lot of this talk surrounds Josh Donaldson um, so at the end of the trade, when the trade deadline was coming up, there was a lot of people who are trying, sort of debating, should we get rid of Josh Donaldson now and, and try and capitalize on his worth or, you know, are his injuries early in the last season going to hinder that and, and how long is he going to stay, yada, yada, yada. So those questions certainly haven't been answered um, at this point. Um, Speaking and, of Donaldson. And so... Okay. No, I was just yeah. wondering, um, what is the... Uh, what is the status of Josh Donaldson? Because I know early in the season, we all heard about uh, he supposedly had dead arm at third base. Um, <laughs> seems like kind of a mysterious situation uh, from afar. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of enlighten us on what's going on there. It's a very confusing situation. And dead arm is the best term that they've really given us. Um, and it's not a great term. So it doesn't sound uh, good. It, it has been confusing to everybody. My understanding is that he was, he, you know, his, his shoulder was tired. There was inflammation. It just wasn't, it, structurally it was sound, but it was almost like tired, overworked to a point. And this is something that he has been dealing with through spring training. But I believe that what pushed him to go onto the disabled list this time was when it started to affect him at the plate. So initially at the beginning of the season, he was designated hitter a lot. He wasn't playing in the field often, um, and, but he said that it didn't you know, hurt his hitting whatsoever. Um, and then at, when it got to the point where it started to affect him at the plate, that's when he went on the DL and he went to Florida. He's been working at the minor league complex. He's um, doing a throwing program, but we don't know when he's gonna come back. Now, it's pretty interesting that, you know, they're having the success with Donaldson's sideline. And also, on the other side of things, not having, you know, an effective Marcus Stroman so far, obviously him struggling to begin the season. Uh, what have you seen from him so far that, that you know, could explain his struggles and maybe would give you some optimism to think that he's going to bounce back to the, the picture that we've known over the last couple of years? Yeah, I think that Marcus Stroman, what what – what gives you the confidence in Marcus Stroman is the fact that he's had these past two strong years and and he he's one of those players that really is not at work so um he's definitely he's definitely been making some adjustments over the last couple of series his last couple of starts which have been interesting he's he's sort of um gone back to some things that he was using last season and 
um, then dropped them again. He dropped them against the New York Yankees. Um, so I think he's just a little bit. I, I think he's almost a little bit confused as to to what's going on um, right now and and why things aren't working and why he's losing control his command sort of late in games. You see him go strong, especially against the Yankees over the weekend. He had five really strong innings and then it just sort of completely lost him. So why he's lo losing that command seems to escape him and it's it's certainly something that he and pitching coach Pete Walker are going to need to sort of lock down because the Blue Jays definitely need um, him to be able to go deeper than, than five solid innings. Um, what is interesting about the Blue Jays this season generally is the fact that there were concerns going into the year that he, they weren't going to be able to score runs and, and the rotation was going to be the thing that was really going to keep them in contention in the American League East, and it's sort of been the opposite so far this year. The the starting pitching hasn't been great, um, but they've scored a, a lot of runs, and the bullpen's been solid, which has been very helpful for them so far this year. But you definitely don't want them overworked by you know the time May comes along. Right. It's, yeah. There's a lot of guys that you know at the beginning of the season you didn't necessarily peg to be key contributors, and then they're all of a sudden kind of holding them afloat here in the early going. So I, that kind of brings me to what, in your perspective, has been the, the most surprising thing so far about the early season success? I think, I think it's the, you know, we talked a lot over the course of the offseason about how the Jays chose to, instead of spending a lot of money on one player, spread the wealth around. And I think that that's proven successful so far. You know, you've seen a Led Mestias, uh, Solarte, come in Curtis Granderson um, and these guys have all contributed so instead of sort of having one star player they have a lot of people who can contribute and you know every once in a while you look at that lineup and maybe one through six one through seven are guys that you know are going to be able to contribute or have contributed at some point over the course of the season there's a couple of guys Randall Grichuk Devin Travis, who really haven't got started yet in terms of their offensive sort of output, but the rest of the guys have all had days where they've contributed, and that's been pretty huge because this this lineup is kind of a no-name lineup when you look at it, but when you have every guy who's who's offering something, then then that's pretty strong. Yeah, and on that, I was if Donaldson eventually comes back, I think one of the biggest surprise contributors uh, for the Jays have been uh, has been I still can never pronounce his name, Jan Gervis Solarte. <laughs> yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, I mean, he's got five home runs. He uh, he's been great so far. Um, do you think he he's played his way into the lineup if and when Donaldson comes back? Yeah, I mean, this was an interesting conversation at the beginning of the year, and and John Gibbons even before Josh Donaldson looked really bad like I mean I guess really before the start of the season um, but he said that it was very important to get Solarte into the lineup um, and that was going to be tricky and it's only gotten trickier of late because you have Teoscar Hernandez who's come up from Buffalo AAA and he is he's is probably their best hitter at this moment so it's going to be interesting to see how this lineup is juggled once Donaldson comes back because you're going to lose some guys who have been really important to the team so far this season there's sort of a um, interesting sort of ease to the way that this lineup can can first set up at the beginning of the game and then um, change when you know pinch hitters come in or whatever the case may be um, and that's not going to be the case when Donaldson comes back. Now, would you say there's a little bit of a, I guess, trying to figure out what this team's identity is? I mean, me and Dakota talked a little bit about uh, the Red Sox in the early going and how they've just been firing on all cylinders, but whether over time this is going to be a team that's more uh, offensive-centric or, or a team that's relying on its starting rotation, just kind of figuring out what exactly is going to be the, uh, the main uh, strong suit of this team going forward. And with Toronto, I feel like it's also in a situation where it's, you know, like you said, it, it was kind of the, the expectation, at least, was that you were going to be relying on the rotation. 
Uh, whereas now it's the, the offense is kind of pulling its weight. So have you noticed that there is, this is a team that's still trying to kind of find that identity? And then ultimately, do you see them contending throughout the season or is this kind of the, just the product of a hot start? Yeah, it, 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 I think it's definitely um, a team that's sort of in transition. You're not really sure what it is that's going to be sort of the crucial part of this squad that that gets Toronto to be a contender. And I think it's kind of a bigger picture. This organization is an organization that is sort of probably a year away from a rebuild in, in, in truth, at this point, they're sort of adding pieces along the way as much as they can, like Hernandez, like Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who came over the weekend. But they're sort of holding place until they can bring their young prospect up, um, which is something that's very exciting for the city. Um, in terms of contending this year, I don't know. I mean, you, you look at the, you need, you need more, I think, from the starting rotation for that to happen. And I I do think that you're going to see guys like Marcus Stroman bounce back and figure it out just because of his history and the fact that he's been able to do it before. Um, But you, you, everything I think needs to go right for this team to be a contender and really ultimately to put in the work that they need to, to contend with the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. Because I still think that those are the two big horses in the American league East. Um, I think the Jays are fine with being a dark horse in the American League. Maybe they'll, you know, squeak out a wild card if everything goes well. But that is, you know, everything's going to need to work. The starting pitching is going to need to get better. The offense is going to need to keep up. And we saw it sort of lag um, in New York over the weekend. And they're going to need to stay healthy, um, which so far you're missing your star. And... They had a huge number of injuries last year, and they need to make sure that that does not happen again. Rob, well, real quick, Laura, right before we go, I just want to know, uh, do you think we see either Vlad Guerrero Jr. or Bo Bichette this season, or are they, not, are they at least another year away? I Honestly, the way that things have worked out for T. Oscar Hernandez, and, and I know that the club is impressed with the way that he has become a better hitter since last September. So I wouldn't personally be surprised if they perhaps came up in September, got a couple of big league act that sort of understood what it's like to be a big league player. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to see them earlier than that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be wildly surprised if they didn't come up this year. I think that the Jays are going to be um really careful with them and they're going to make sure that they don't rush them they think it's very important developmentally that they see every um level of the the minor leagues and at this point they're only in double a so there's there's some time still um and some legwork to put in before before they bring them up i know i'm, I'm kind of interested to see this team firsthand i haven't really seen them yeah. yet this year obviously um so yeah. with all the boston toronto stuff going well, on right well the now. thing is too is that you know i think red sox fans they think blue jays and they automatically have you know images of edwin encarnacion and jose batista hitting it to new hampshire <laughs> and honestly yeah. it's a much different look and feel for this team this year uh and then especially next year with the, the guys that we've touched on yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's been really weird this year without Jose Bautista, and then you know seeing him in the Atlanta Braves ranks is is very unusual <laughs> for a lot of people in Toronto. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, Laura. Well, we'll let you go, but we certainly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And uh, thanks for having me. This should be a, an interesting series. Definitely, a, kind of a litmus test for both teams. For sure. All right. Thanks, Laura. It was Laura Armstrong, Tor- Toronto Blue Jays beat writer for the Toronto Star. Uh, and thanks again to her. You can follow her on Twitter at Laura Army. All right, so uh, certainly it'll be uh, kind of our first taste of the Blue Jays for this season. See what they're what they're up to. Um, interesting. Uh, interesting to see whether. This AL East is going to shake up to be more than a, a two-horse race, uh, like we mentioned. It, I think we can. We're you and I are both in the same boat of uh, completely writing off the Orioles and the Rays. 
yeah. as far as the season goes. But the thing is about the AL East that's so weird, not weird, but just you come to expect it, is, uh, yeah, it's going to be a two-horse race, you're, you're pretty sure. But every team in that division is a, is, is a tough beat, even the Rays. Because even when the Rays have had bad teams, they, pay, they play you close. Those games are weird down in Tropicana. That park is weird. Everything about that franchise is weird. And you just know the games are going to be, yeah, every, the games are going to be, like, just, I don't know, odd. And the Orioles are a tough matchup, or, or a tough, you know, opponent. Show Walter is a great manager. They have, you know, they have good talent. The Jays, you know, they can definitely step up. So, I mean, while it's going to be a two-horse race, I think we all believe that. I don't think, you know, every game against these AL East opponents is, you know, you got to take seriously. Because they are still, you know, talented teams that can, that can get you if you don't bring your best. All right, so let's uh, let's touch them all before we get the hell out of here. Let's do a little, just kind of go around the league a little bit. I want to start with the uh, the Rays, as we just mentioned them. <laughs> what could you Catch. possibly have to talk about the Rays? Uh, so I think it was you that was actually very uh, boisterous about this the other day. Carlos Gomez. Oh, that's right. Foot, yep. Uh, after the walk off home run against the Minnesota Twins uh, on Sunday. There was a, it was a theatrical performance for the ages, really. Oh, it was so there was stupid. Some pointing to the dugout. There was pointing to the, the heavens. There was pointing to, to, to people waving car, you know, cowbells. And there was the tongue wag. And Ray Lewis there made his a, appearance. There was a Ray Lewis dance yep. uh, in the home plate. It really, just a whole bunch going on. Great theater. Um, what were your thoughts on it? Okay, well, first of all, the whole thing is dumb. I mean, you hit a walk-off homer in April. Uh, what, were they, what were they playing? The Twins? The Twins. Yeah, against the Twins. And you're playing for the Rays. There's no one at the trop. So, to, you know, to pimp a home run like that is bizarre. But at the same time, like, I have no issues with the bat flips. I know people nope. get all upset about it. No. Nope. I'm, I'm kind of a weird case because I am, you know, kind of an old grumpy baseball guy. I'm a baseball purist. But on the other hand, I do not care about bat flips. I think... That they're funny, they're interesting. You know, if anything, it makes you hate a guy a little bit. So you know, it makes you more interested to see if you know makes he gets beaned the next time he gets up. And uh, I mean, I hate Ray Lewis. I know I, I just Ray Lewis is one of my least favorite athletes. So any seeing a Ray Lewis dance, I hated that because I just you know any any way Ray Lewis enters the conversation annoys me. I'm but, with uh, you on the bat flip thing. Yeah. Uh, like I bat flips and. Like touchdown celebrations is another one where I couldn't care less to the point where if you like it, keep it in the game. If you don't like it, don't pay attention. Like I don't, I don't care. Like I don't, not tuning in for that thing. So I guess in that sense, I'm all in with it. You know, it's just, just how does your life? As you made, mentioned, how, like these people that hate bat flips. How is your life a, made? How is your life made any worse by a man flipping yeah, his bat? How did, so, did did he really lose sleep at night? What do you care? So yeah, I I I, love, I think it's 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 entertaining. I get well, I, people find it entertaining, and for that I'm on board with it. Now it's not my cup of tea, but I don't hate it. It's just one of the, like I, don't, I just don't give a crap. Uh, but if it's gonna get people talking, if it's gonna get people drive up interest, like you said, create some villains in this game. It, it's the thing about sports. You need you need some bad guys. Right. You know you, you need those guys that you you love to root against. Uh, and Carlos Gomez has certainly established himself as one of those guys over the years with some of his antics. Um, and so, you know, whatever. It plays into the character, so I'm all about it. Now, if you want to fire back and say, like, you know, this is the, the middle of April, this is a team that has eight wins through their first 21 games, that's fine, but that's part of the deal. You know, if that's, you can come back with that defense, and he has the right to say, all right, well, I had a walk-off home run. It's, just a lot, it's give and take. Uh, so I got no issues with it. I think it was somewhat entertaining. I thought it was it was funny. Yeah. I mean, but that guy, you just expect it with that guy. I'm certainly he's such not going to be the you know the old man yelling at the cloud. Like this is no. this is you will be someday. Happens. Someday you will be that. Probably. I'll, it's just it's not the hill I'm going to die on. Speaking of people you love to, to root against or hate, um, I mean another another thing from around the majors is uh, Derek Jeter, yeah. uh, Miami Marlins co-owner CEO. Former Yankee shortstop. Uh, was it with Brian Gumble? Uh, he had an interview uh, yeah. with Brian Gumble. I, and when I first read this, actually, I saw uh, it was like Derek Jeter calls Brian Gumble weak minded or something. And I was <laughs> like, I, I need to click on this story. Um, um, yeah, good headline. Talking about clickbait. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any personal attack on Ryan. And an unrelated note. Uh, we were, Mentally weak. We were talking about this earlier from today. I think the headline, the best headline on the internet all day today is science confirms Uranus stinks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, they're completely unrelated, but that's probably my favorite headline from the day. Um, either way, G Derek Jeter told Bryant Gumbel that uh, he basically, you know, laughed, scoffed at the notion that the, the Marlins would be tanking or that he'd instruct them to tank. Um, you know, what do you think? Do you, do you believe Jeets? Do you believe him? I, I, none of this makes any sense to me, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> I don't get the concept of tanking in baseball or saying that especially in baseball is tanking yeah baseball is so different from every other North American sport that it's basically impossible to tank like you could tank but the odds of that tanking working is I would say slim or it just it's not like in basketball where you tank, you get the number one overall pick, and you might turn things around in a couple of years. I mean, you're tanking and you're drafting a pitcher out of high school, but it's not even going to sniff the major for five years. Right. So it's plus there's and, so and many this, rounds. And another thing Oops. is that how, how do you what do you consider tanking? You know, trading off Giancarlo Stanton for a piece. Of, they probably could have got a better return for that, but that's a conversation. But it's day. just been yeah. this has been going on for years in baseball where you trade off. You know, if you're in a situation where you have these these contracts that you don't want, uh, feel like you can maximize your asset by by trading it away at a, you know an opportune time and bringing in minor leaguers who can eventually help you build a foundation for a successful franchise. I mean, like this is all about strategy. This is the crap that's been going on for years. So I just I don't really get the whole the word tanking in baseball. Just do not go together. So I, that's where you kind of lose me a little bit. I get it. Derek Jeter's been kind of a, it's been a PR nightmare so far since he's been there. But uh, to to just like start pointing the finger and say this guy's tanking, like it's, I don't know, it doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, the whole thing's dumb. Um, I think. He tanks Listen, if you want to say the potential to draft this two-way, you know, seventeen-year-old from well, there's also two sides of tanking. Like you could say that maybe a, a given franchise want, and th this is the thing that always bothers me when, when people talk about tanking is if you want to say the organization or the like the, the people in the front office and the coach are positioning the franchise or putting them in a position to lose so that they can get better draft picks. Fine, you know, I'll, I'll, I can believe it. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying Jeter's doing that. I'm just saying I get that. What bothers me is there is no way a bunch of players on a crappy team, all these players that, I mean, they want to get contracts. They want to put up good stats. They want to, they want to, you know, when they hit free agency, they want to make a team. They want to leave a good impression. They're not going to go out there and, and lose on purpose or play bad on purpose, especially like players on bad teams have the least amount of incentive to tank. You know, I get it if you want to say the, the owner or the coach is, is trying to do this and that. I'm not saying, I don't think that's happening in Miami. But the fact is, I can never, under any scenario, imagine a player, especially on a bad team. You know, that's basically a tryout for you. Right. And, and this it's, is, it's a tryout for your dreams. And you're it's not going to lose on purpose. It's a loaded question, purpose. too. You're going to swing and miss on purpose? It's if, stupid. If you're going to ask whole thing is done. Uh, a team owner or a team executive or coach or whoever about their team tanking, the, you're obviously going to get... A response that's kind of what Judah gave in the sense that we expect to win every day, blah blah blah. Like, he, and you just take it for what it is. It's right. A, a, that, what else is he gonna say? Yeah. You know a lot I mean? of good so, research by Brian Gumble on that one. Um, Brian Gumble. Yeah. No, maybe. Good questions, Brian. It's it's just one of the. I just. I don't, yeah. The, the whole tanking in baseball. I, I don't get it. I don't get the premise. Uh, and when you do ask those questions, you, you know what you're gonna get for a response. So. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I'm laying off Jeter on this one. Same. For, so for whatever criticisms you have of him, uh, this is not one. This is not one. I'm yeah. Gonna, I'm gonna go after him for. Well, yeah. What about you? You got anything from around the around the bigs that that stuck out to you? I mean, I have one other one, but you go you, ahead before we get out of here. We'll okay, we'll do it real quick. Uh, so Albert Pujols. You've been chopping at the bit to talk about Albert Pujols, by the way. You no, I haven't. About, you yeah, you have. <laughs> Throughout the course of the week, you mentioned him about 15 times. 
I mean, I, I maybe, maybe you're right. You're following I'm this not, pursuit of 3,000 hits more than anybody on the planet. I, well, I love baseball statistical milestones. I'm not one of these people that has forgotten how cool 500 home runs is or 3,000 hits are. So, yeah, the fact that... All right, Mr. 3,000. What, what yeah. for? Uh, well, no, just Pujols is, I, th- I don't know, what is he, six, seven hits away from 3,000? And uh, so just, obviously, the guy's a Hall of Famer. I think we basically... He's not going to get to Hank Aaron, to uh, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds' record or anything. There was a period there where, you know, if he lived up to the expectations of the contract, you could make the case he would have gotten to Bonds' record, um, home run record. But uh, with Albert Pujols approaching 3,000 hits, yeah. uh, I'm just curious where you think, where he stands for you in terms of the best hitters, either of the generation or that you've seen in your lifetime, um, you know, where he ranks among those for you. Because I'm not going to try and rank him among Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig because I, I never saw those guys. But people you've watched and people sort of in this generation, you know, let's say after the year 2000, whatever, uh, where is he for you? He's right on the top. I mean, Is there anybody better? I think for, for the longest time, and this is, I will admit, an incredibly biased opinion probably, uh, and just from having watched him day in and day out, I always thought like Manny Ramirez is the best right-handed hitter I've seen, or like one, one of the best right-handed hitters I've seen. Right. And then as Poole started to, you know, solidify his his stature amongst the game's greats, uh, he was right there, right? Like, you know, probably overtook him. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely did. So, I'm and sorry. I think we kind of lose sight of that too, just because of it hasn't been the, the best tenure uh, since signing with the Angels, signing the huge contract. Um, and you almost forget how good he was. It's almost like he's been hanging on a little bit, I guess you could say. Uh, but, it, dude, he was legit. Yeah, and I mean, His numbers are I insane. think we can only have this conversation if we just eliminate steroids. Let's just, like, completely eliminate it from the debate entirely. Um, and so with that, I mean, I don't know. I think A-Rod might have been better for me. I mean, A-Rod hits, like, 700 home runs. Yeah. I mean, that's... Better, yeah, better power hitter, but I just think of, when I think pool holes, I just think of him driving balls into the gap, like left and And he right. just has such a perfect stance and a perfect swing. And I, I mean, I guess you could say Pujols is a pure hitter, a better pure hitter. Uh, what about Miguel Cabrera? I think the problem is now he's kind of breaking down a little bit and you wonder if his numbers are really going to tail off. But that I was going to say, it's similar to the pool situation where it's going to get to a point where, like you kind of forget a little bit how good he was in his prime because you're kind of you're just witnessing the, the tail end of his career. Yeah. Uh, but he's another one that, I mean, you, when you were talking about like the triple crown season and yeah. that sort of... Which I hate of, that people minimize. But. Th- that sort of, uh, like that, that time frame. I'll tell you what, I, there's no bias I here. Pools was the better hitter, though. Yeah. And, and no bias here, but... Like, the way David Ortiz played in his last two seasons, or the last few seasons with the Red Sox, I mean, he looked like, and granted, it took him until he was 40, but he became such a complete, like, I don't know, just terrifying hitter for people, for uh, for other teams. I'm not going to say he was on Pujols' level or A-Rod's level, but I think it was he was a lot closer by the end than, than people give him credit for. I mean, he was sitting over 300. He was you know, nearly impossible to pitch to because he was so disciplined at the plate. And I think he does belong in that conversation. He didn't have the career numbers uh, and didn't do it year in, year out like some of those guys. But he, he's, in that, he's in there for me a little bit. All right. Are you, uh, how are you going to celebrate his 3,000th hit? <laughs> uh, Is it dinner? I don't know. I probably, I'm not going to do anything. I don't no, know. Was, no. I know you're big on uh, statistical milestones. Yeah, maybe I'll... Uh, go to Stan Ross Randall. Maybe I'll go to Cooperstown and just stand in the hall and visualize <laughs> his plaque and just stay there all weekend alone. All right. Let's hit the bricks. Uh... As always, you can follow us on Twitter, myself, at the Ricky Doyle, Dakota. Uh, I don't at Dak Randall. At Dak Randall. Um, if you want to, if you got any gripes with us, uh, if you want to send us viruses or whatever, <laughs> uh, we'll be sure not to open them. Uh, and we'll be back next week for, for another, uh, we'll see what happens with this, with this Jay series. And then, like I said earlier, the, the Red Sox will welcome the Rays into town and then the... The Kansas City Royals is actually is midweek day baseball wrapped in there somewhere. I think really? It's the I Royals. haven't looked at the schedule. I think it's so. uh, next Wednesday. I'm pretty excited for that. Love day baseball. Man. That's fine. That's yeah. One of my favorite things on planet Earth. Um, but all right, we're going to get out of here. Thanks you, thank you again for joining us on this week's edition of the Nesson Red Sox podcast. And also a thank you to Laura Armstrong of the Toronto Star for joining us to talk a little Blue Jays. All right, we'll see you next time. Take care. Everybody. See you.